Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Automotive Logistics Mexico 2016. Perhaps one of the first things I should point out is that the, the whole conference will be in both languages, English and Spanish. So if you need a simultaneous translation, which will be going on throughout the whole two days, please collect your headsets uh, from just outside the room because the, the presentations and the, and the questions could be in either Spanish or English. My name is Louis Yakumi. I'm the publisher of the Automotive Logistics Group, who are publishers of Automotive Logistics and Finnish Vehicle Logistics magazines and the organisers of the Automotive Logistics Global Series of Conferences that take place in Europe, China, USA, Russia, Brazil, UK, India, and uh, of course now for the second year in, in Mexico. Last year was our first conference in Mexico, and we are delighted to be back in your beautiful and exciting country to look at the next stages of growth and development in your region. We're honored to have so much participation from the federal and local governments because it shows how much they appreciate the importance of not just the automotive industry, but the logistics sector as well. It's good to hear that because it's, it's one of the challenges of the automotive industry, uh, as you know, here in Mexico. Mexico has become one of our favorite conferences here because of the the friendliness of the people, the excitement of the region, the excitement of the industry. Uh, it's a, Mexico City is a beautiful city, and of course, we can continue our exploration of the wonderful food of Mexico. I think last year was uh, Taco al Pastore, and this year was uh, Chiqui Mole. So I'm already looking forward to next year to see what I can find. I'd like to thank our sponsors of the conference who, who help us to, to put this together. Uh, for this year, we're proud to have as premier sponsors of our conference, Penske Logistics, who are also hosting the, the gala dinner tonight. Our gold sponsors, uh, Protrans, Royale, Ryder, and XPO Logistics. Our, gold spo our uh, global sponsors, who so-called because they sponsor our conferences all around the world, are Chet Automotive and Industrial, CTM Law, and Willanius Wilhelmson Logistics. And our silver sponsors, Air Charter Service, APL Logistics, CNW, Goodpack, Inform, KHS, Orbis, Port Canaveral, and Seglo Logistics. They sponsor the conference because they have services or expertise or products uh, to support your companies and move your products uh, or support you to, from, and in Mexico. So please visit their booths in the, in the coffee break area, read their literature, and meet their people. And the conference, conference industry has also changed. I remember I used to say at the beginning of the conferences, please turn off your mobile phones. But now I say, please have your smartphones and your tablets and iPads ready. Automotive Logistics is part of the Automotive Logistics Live program. So we're delighted to welcome viewers from all around the world who are watching the conference live, watching the presentations live. It also means if you use the, uh, use the app, uh, you, can, you can post questions and comments that can be read by other attendees and can also be seen by the moderator so we can ask your questions to the panel or out to the audience. You can see details on the screen of of how to, how to log on uh, to, the, to Automotive Logistics Live. You can also send direct messages to other attendees of the conference. And later on in the conference, we'll be holding special voting surveys. So you can use your devices, your smartphones, or your tablets to vote as well. And don't plan on leaving the conference early, either today or, or tomorrow. We've got a great full two days, starting off today, where we talk about uh, the state of the industry, where, where automotive is in Mexico and where it's going, uh, to the end of the day when we look at some of the new plants and, that are developing or that are, grow, or that are being brought here to, to Mexico and looking at world-class logistics. Uh, the second session today, we have the governor of the, the secretary of the economy giving a keynote speech on Mexican government plans for investing in automotive and logistics. And tomorrow we have the famous automotive logistics think tanks in the afternoon. We have the Charles d'Affaires from the US Embassy speaking at the lunch tomorrow, 
and we end the conference with our, with our 2020 vision panel where we look ahead to the future of automotive logistics with a fantastic, people of, uh, fantastic panel of senior executives from, from the most important car makers in, in Mexico uh, and logistics companies as well. So that's, the, that's kind of my, my introduction. Um, but what I'd like to, uh, I spoke earlier about how much we've enjoyed coming to Mexico, learning about Mexico, and particularly enjoyed Mexico City. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Victor Hugo Lopez Aranda from the Ministry of Economic Development of Mexico City to uh, officially welcome us uh, to, to their wonderful city. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. Me voy a permitir hablar en. Good morning. I'm going to speak in Spanish. I know this is a bilingual audience. On behalf of Miguel Angel Mancera, Mayor of Mexico City and Secretary of Economy, Mr. José Antonio Cheritsky, who were not able to join us here at Automotive Logistics, I don't know if you know this, but in previous days, the political constitution of Mexico City suffered a transformation. We will not be the federal district no longer, and we will become Mexico City. We will have a new constitution created just for Mexico City. That is why our program, or the program of the city mayor and the as the agenda of the Secretary, the Ministry of Economic Development is a bit overwhelmed. That's why they are not able to join us here. But I'm glad to be here, mainly because of two reasons. First of all, the Ministry of Economic Development throughout the last two years has encouraged investment throughout several sectors in Mexico City. So first of all, let me l explain the size of Mexico City. If we should consider Mexico City as a country, it would be the sixth economy in Latin America. Our GDP would equal Peru's. Mexico City is a country per se. It has the largest amount of engineers who studied in the Northern Hemisphere. Mexico City also has the highest number of research centers throughout the country. Hence, Mexico City does not only provide for opportunities for investment, but it can also supply talent. 30 years ago, due to pollution and accelerated growth in the city, it was decided that heavy industry would not be a target for investment. That is why we started to migrate the main automotive companies to other states because they were high water consumers and they left Mexico City. Therefore, Mexico City became a city for services and trade. Mexico City and the government of the federal district is now encouraging the development of technological development centers. We are also fostering the creation of talent throughout the federal district. Not only that, we invite everyone because large corporations headquarters are located in the city due to financial services, business services, and of course, logistic services. Mexico City doesn't only provide the opportunity for corporate and business services, but also for light manufacturing, because we have also encouraged the creation of new companies, creation of employment, and non-polluting light manufacturing. There's still room for investment in Mexico City, so it is now the time to invite you to explore Mexico City. 
Later on, we will share more specific data on Mexico City and how it is a great opportunity for investment. Let me finish by inviting you to enjoy Mexico City. I would say that Mexico City has suffered an immense transformation in the past 15 years. In Mexico City, you can not only have great food, but great shows as well. It's a city where you can walk, where you can enjoy Mexico City's nighttime is entertainment, entertaining. So we hope you enjoy your stay in Mexico City. We are here to provide opportunities and to facilitate investment in our city. Thank you very much. Have a successful automotive logistics event. Thank you for choosing Mexico City because it's a great city. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks very much for that wonderful welcome to your fantastic city. Uh, next up, um, one of the most important uh, organizations or associations for, for the Mexican automotive industry that does a lot to support, support your industry and certainly understands the pressures that, are, that you guys have faced from a logistics and supply chain perspective. Delighted to welcome to the podium Eduardo Solis, the president of AMIA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. Um, I really would like to thank Automotive Logistics for this uh, kind invitation. Eh, voy a hacer mi presentación en español porque... My presentation will be in Spanish because I know there's translation. I wish to salute Victor Hugo Lopez. Please send my regards to Dr. Cherinsky. Thank you for having us all in this new state that was just created. We hope all protocols are dealt with and every Mexicano will be able to enjoy this new status. Es un placer estar aquí con todos ustedes en este podio. And of course, I salute the attendance to this event. My presentation is in English. I know that we have simultaneous translation. So in the 20 minutes I have left, I only have 14, I guess. Era una broma en realidad. No te preocupes, Louis. Por lo general suelo tomarme como 50 minutos no los 20 que me dieron. Perhaps you're familiar with figures already, but this is a logistics event. So I am forced to comment on relevant issues, especially because this is such a powerful industry in Mexico, the automotive sector, AMIA groups, the assemblers throughout the country. We uh, have Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Nissan, Volkswagen, Nissan, Mazda, Toyota, Mercedes, BMW, Volvo. Every light vehicle brand is a member of our association. We represent the automotive industry from the terminal, from the automotive industry's endpoint. This type of event organized by Louis at a moment, at the moment we are living, becomes key. If logistics in the manufacturing sector is a relevant ingredient when it comes to the equations that are carried out to know if you're going to be competitive or not, well, in the automotive industry, it becomes more than key, it becomes a paramount, especially because our industry is increasingly growing. In the following slides, you'll learn how such a high 
demanding industry, demanding of services to deliver parts, components, and finished product becomes a must. In the, between 2014 and 2020, we will have a 60% growth. What's interesting is that as of NAFTA's uh, creation in 1994 and up to 2014, we grew in a paramount way. We're talking about 2 million manufactured vehicles. We went to one to three figures in just 20 years. It turns out that from 2014 to 2020, we will grow to more. So take a look at what is happening. In just 20 years, we grew 2 million units manufactured in Mexico. So in seven years, from 2014, early 2014 to late 2020, we will grow an additional two. That's what's happening pressures for demand on services that will enable displacement of product both nationally and internationally because we account for 25 percent of manufacturing exports in Mexico. 83 of what we manufacture is exported. We generate above $50 billion of net currency. We don't have the, the figure, we don't have the graphics for 2015. It hasn't yet been issued by the Bank, Bank of Mexico. But we know that we will grow above 49 million dollars above $50 billion. By far the main generator of currency in the country. 83 of what we manufacture is exported. Half of what is sold locally is fulfilled with exports because Mexican manufacturing is devoted from Mexico to the world. So it's a, a huge challenge. Railroads, customs, airports. That is why this conference that gathers us here will have extremely important conclusions, but don't have in mind those 3 million, 3.4 million cars that we manufactured in 2015 reaching historic levels. But just think of what is yet to come. By late 2020, we will be above 5 million because that is the challenge. The challenge of completing second level supply chains that will just add up more pressure on logistic services. We are top manufacturers in Latin America. We exceeded Brazil in 2014 and let us confirm in 2015 what happened is Brazil entered into a crisis. It's, it's, it's a powerful company, a country. It will recover, but Mexico is strong as well. The difference is that we are competing against the world. Brazil cannot open up its economy because Brazil is not ready to compete. They have a competitiveness issue. Their customs are 35, 40, and up to 60% duties. We are fourth, we're ranked as number four in exports, and our GDP went from 2% to 3% in eight years. National GDP. Approaching 19% of manufacturing GDP. There it is. Take a look at it. Just in 2010, we were in 2.2% of GDP. We're in 3.2 in preliminary 2015 data.
These are interesting figures that have not been disseminated. Whenever we talk about the manufacturing sector, and I like to say that we are the most important sector within manufacturing because I'm not considering agriculture. But there we are next to the agro industry because that's what they what we are. If we compare us against agro industry, you know, we're above steel, chemicals, we're above any other sector. But take a look at what happens. The agro uh, agro industry and automotive industry went to 24.6 percent, and they have manufacturing GDP. We grew in such a way that we don't have figures of 2015, but we just saw it. We now have 18.3 in preliminary 2015 data. We went from 11 to 18.3. Well, they went from 24 to 23.6. That's our sector. Here it is. We've spoke about this publicly. The importance of exports among the country's top exports, such as oil products, services that reach to us through remittances, or tourism. Take a look at the dark line, the black line in the chart. Those are automotive exports. Take a look at the slope, the slope in a chart like this. This is what happened with other countries, those countries we left behind. In 29, we left Canada, France, behind in order to become the fourth exporter in the world. Only countries such as Germany, the U.S., and Japan rank higher than us. This industry has an extremely important added value. Whenever I am asked if this is part of a successful outsourcing industry, whenever we talk about outsourcing or maquila, which seems to provide low added value when everything is imported and they just assemble things here. Well, that's not what happens with us. That's not us. Assemblers add 55.4 average according to the Statistics and Census National Center. So among national inputs and added value for products, in uh, facilities, we're talking about 55.4%. So it's added value, domestic inputs. So we are not, not outsourcing. We're talking about a strong plants with an extremely high added value. We also need to talk about manufacturing per se throughout the country. These are figures, figures of the 2014 economic census. The INEGI, the Statistics National Center, just released this information. Gross production, net production in states such as Sonora that perhaps make a little less noise than the central region. In Sonora, value-based production <coughs> is an extremely high type of production because Sonora manufactures luxury vehicles. 
So we're talking about interesting data. There you go. You have a production which reaches 3.4 million in 2014. But what's interesting is that we have a forecast for 2020. And why am I insisting on this chart? Because it says that by 2019, we will reach those 5 million. I pr prefer to be conservative about it and talk about 2020 because I'm conservative. It's a reality because we have created new plants. Kia is just starting to manufacture commercial vehicles in Nuevo León. Audi will also start to manufacture this year and fully commercially by 2017. We have BMW in San Luis Potosí by 2018, 2019. Mercedes-Benz is going to come uh, to in infinity. It, we have Nissan with its third plant, with the, the Infinity plant in Aguascalientes. We have new plants, new expansions, and new announcements as well. So if we add that up to growth, but in early 2014, Mazda op opened up and they ended up with over 100,000 vehicles. By 2014, 2015, 200,000. In Toyota, that will start to build its uh, plant in Paseo Grande near Guanajuato, near Querétaro. This is something without precedence. In Span, in the past 20 years, they opened up two automotive plants. So when they tell me, hey, you know, Eduardo, but this is it about labor. Why don't you put it in those terms? Because you're talking about cheap labor. But if it were cheap labor, if it were a cheap labor issue, these plants would be located in Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Panama, Ecuador. How many plants do we have in those seven countries I just mentioned? And they have a lower labor profile cost. There are none. Seven countries and no assembly plant. So if it's uh, something related to a labor profile, we would have one here, one there. There are seven countries with cheap labor. Mm. Vehicle manufacturing is not cheap labor. It has to do with productivity. It has to do with having a package of elements such as a robust supply chain, Quite highly qualified labor with experience. Our network of commercial agreements, no doubt about it, provide competitiveness, but most importantly, the geographical allocation of in our country. We have a huge challenge to the future. When we say that we're going to grow 2 million units more in less than half the time we did in the last 20 years, we also have to mention we have basic challenges. Qualified labor, labor flow. We have to make sure we have a highly qualified labor because as soon as a plant opens, they need 3,000 people to start manufacturing. Audi had 450 people in Germany being trained. But Audi, Audi will require 3,500 people. But around a plant assembly, we're talking about 30 to 40,000 people. The labor flow has to be a world-class labor and provide certainty to those investments. Number two, keep the ro a robust supply chain and take advantage of all the opportunities because as robust our supply chain is, which is basic for attracting investors. 
we also have to mention that the s second level provider, everything, everything has to be done. At the second level vendor or provider, everything has to be done. 90% of a uh, first level provider is requiring of input. 90% is important. That's not our case. We have first level suppliers, very strong suppliers. They have to keep up growing if we're going to be growing that by 60%. But the first level provider is looking for doing business with the plant assembly. We have Bosch, Continental, Denso, and all these companies. They are looking for negotiations from the, at the corporate level and that's not the case of the second level, so the second tier uh, provider. And the supply chain is in the small and medium sized companies because 90% is imported. And sometimes it's because uh, we need more training, sometimes we need funding, and sometimes because we are not certified. And we need to talk about that as well. And the third element and great challenge to be able to get to 2020 safely with this growth is logistics. That's why we're here today. Because if we do, if we, if we have a forecast, Veracruz will not be able to be there. I was talking to the authorities in Veracruz, and I was talking about the export profiles, and from 8 to 10 a.m., there is no commerce. We do not import or export many things from 8 to 10 a.m. You need to laugh, but just take notes of everything that I'm saying. Why? Why is this happening? Why the assembly plants do not use that slot, you know, that space, that slot between 8 to 10 to start doing business, and they start at 10 when everybody is exporting? Well, Eduardo, because they have to uh, wait till it's more in the morning to get to, to download products or why don't you do that eight at night and they can be there at eight in the morning because there's no light, there's no uh, lighting in the yards. Can you understand that? I can't, re really. I am certain that today we're not going to talk about having lighting at the yards in the, uh, the main ports because we take everything for granted, right? We take uh, for granted that there has to be lighting so we can work 24 hours a day and you don't start stacking at 8 so you can be ready at 11 and 12 or 12 and be ready to start doing business or moving the merchandise. Everything has to do with being more efficient and today this is true and I say because this is the media here don't take it uh, this don't take this uh, the wrong way Eduardo Solis is not here to tell you that we have a huge problem what I'm saying is that we have to make sure that as the we're going to be growing till 2020 we have to reach 2020 safely with the figures that I just showed you if we don't start working right, right, right away to expand the ports, the yards, and lights, of course, lighting in the yards. If there is someone from the uh, electricity company in Mexico, please take notes, R really. We have to start working all together to start working on that forecast to make sure that this industry continues being successful. More than 40 sectors in the country will be positive, positively affected by this industry. That is, we have a e positive influence on more than 40 sectors that t 
is that are dragged by the success in our industry we're very fortunate and with a topic that we have to discuss this success depends on the world market 2008-2009 taught us that the crisis the broader real crisis led us to a 30 percent drop in production not only in mexico but in the world 83 percent of what we produce is exported that's why it is important to have a robust internal market last year we had a 19 percent growth we have to keep on working in the internal market to balance so that the export success can be accompanied by investments that come to mexico to sell in our market can you please put this the last slide could you could you please display the last slide because i want to share with you our social media because uh, i only have 15 followers you know so i would like to have more more followers and i feel by my colleagues from other company agencies have 20,000 please follow us if i if you do it i will get a commission and it, every day we have a tweet we uh, the data of today at emia um, mexico and my facebook is is the same note but we have more space as the mexican association of the uh, automotive industry with the with uh, small letters i'm going to, i want to reach 30 followers so please take notes take note of my uh, twitter so it was an honor to be here with all of you thank you very much Muchísimas gracias. Sharing the opportunities, the growth, the excitement of the Mexico automotive industry, but also touched upon some of the challenges. The good news is the challenges sound relatively, you know, if our industry will work together, they, they, can, be, they can be solved. Uh, but the, the desire has to be there. And, uh, and AMIR are, are a fantastic organization to try and, and lobby and to support our industry or your industry. Uh, next up, we've talked, you know, about uh, logistics and the automotive industry, but it's, you know, it's also a bit of a tough industry. One of the things that's going to be the, the car makers and the logistics companies are doing voluntarily, but will also be maybe forced into it a little bit, is, you know, becoming more sustainable and what this all means for, uh, for the energy industry. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome to the, to the podium as our next speaker, Santiago Creueras, the Director General for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability from the Ministry of Energy of Mexico. Thank you. ¿Qué tal? Muy buenos días. Tengan todos. Today, for the ones that live in Mexico City, I had to face a problem in a, there was a traffic jam because of an accident and I arrived late I would like to apologize because of my being late of my being late but I really thank you for the invitation to be here I would like to salute all my colleagues here in the podium and specifically the representative of the government of Mexico City Eduardo Solis, President of, uh, Chairman of AMIA, and the Ministry of Energy has a very close relationship with uh, uh, AMIA, and or Louis also for his invitation to be able to be here with all of you today, this morning. On behalf of the Ministry of Energy, the transport topic is really, really important. As you all know, a couple of weeks ago, the, the act of an energetic transition was approved. This uh, new uh, legal framework is one of the elements that was pending in relation to the energy um, framework reform 
and we're very happy to have this new act because it's sh guide us on how to proceed and transportation of course has been included let me tell you very briefly about the new mandate related to this new act in the next f following weeks and during this year according to the schedule that has been established in this act we will have to create three ruling documents the first document is a national strategy for energetic energy transition to be able to move forward to cleaner uh, fuels in this transition period we will set up the long and medium uh, the medium and long term scenarios at 15 and 20 years and in this strategy the efficiency goals for energy efficiency and clean energies would have to be set up in our country in every sector we are currently working on including transportation but also uh, commercial buildings public cons uh, buildings uh, regulations standardization and all the items included and uh, specifically everything related to clean energy te technology such as air uh, uh, energy pr uh, provided by uh, air farms, uh, wind farms, and uh, other things. So we're going to have an energy transition program and a program for the sustainable um, uh, uh, for sustainable energy. The, these uh, schedules want to uh, pave the way for the following two years and provide the guidelines during this administration and that ha has been established in the act these two uh, programs have to be done at the beginning of the each administration and since this act was just recently passed so we are going to have to do some activities in 260 days and others in 360 days. So the creation of these documents will have to be ready by the end of this year. In these documents, we will establish the clean energy goals as well as the tr energy efficiency goals with a specific direction or route. Within this framework, we also have something really, really interesting in the act, which are the innovation, the Mexican innovation centers. We currently have some in Mexican innovation centers related to clean energies. We are currently working on new Mexican innovation centers related to taking advantage of sustainability, energy sustainability, and by the end of this administration, we will be able to consolidate a Mexican, Mexican center, innovation center for uh, construction, for transport, so that all the stakeholders can work together on the uh, on this direct in this direction so how can we do this as uh, well the way we have been doing it in the with us uh, innovation centers for clean energies we need to have the involvement of the private public and, uh, and public sectors as well as the academy uh, and so we can create the synergies and create a short medium and long-term agenda that can help us move forward forward in, uh, in relation to this new act. I would like to talk about one of the projects that we have been working on with Ania. I didn't have the opportunity to listen to my friend Eduardo's presentation, but in this uh, transition of uh, 
the, in this energy transition, we are certain that we can start exploring electric vehicles as well as hybrid vehicles. We have agreed this with EMEA, and we have to think of which are the actions that have to be taken from the regulation standpoint, which are the regulations from the technological point of view that have to be taken place, the act uh, the actions uh, related to infrastructure, uh, related to uh, incentives. There are other countries in which these type of actions have been done, and one of the areas we are currently innovating and that we are really interested in working as a Ministry of Energy together with AMIA and together with the as a, a ma manufacturers in the state, which is the main man infrastructure that we need so that the electrical vehicles can work here. We need electric uh, stations. How many stations do we have to have in the country? Which is the category of these electric stations? The medium or fast uh, charge or charging and this will allow us to move towards uh, this transition and we can start thinking on how we can achieve the, world, the goals that we have set up. I would also like to take advantage of this uh, opportunity to comment some of the programs we're currently working on and that of obviously it includes transport transportation. It is um, a project where we want to have a energy efficiency and, and, and sustainability in several um, uh, and we are very glad to be working with Mexico City and uh, at least in one city in each state of the country where together with the World Bank we are developing a project and taking advantage of uh, a tool called Trace that allows us to uh, look at the potential of uh, saving energy on waste management, on sustainable building and transportation, uh, water pumping, and uh, public lighting. So with this, we are now learning about the opportunities we can start working on and somehow we will be able to see how we can start intervening uh, together all together and reduce energy consumption or energy use in different cities we are working to be able to have funding or fin financial uh, tools because without the without them these may become barriers to be able to achieve our goals as i said before this is one of the most ambitious projects we have we have to start working with the different states with their cities mm, the federal government cannot address all the issues we have related to a sustainable uh, energy sustainability and we are certain that the synergies we are achieving right now in the case of mexico from uh, the visitors we have from abroad we have around 2400 municipalities and um, we have around 385 municipalities that have been considered uh, cities because they have a certain number of inhabitants according to the statistics that take place based on the uh, International Agency of Energy and others. And this number may be increased in uh, the next decade by 20 or 
25%. So in Mexico City, we're going to have around 500 cities within the 2,400 municipalities that we have. And uh, this has an impact on all the items that I mentioned related to energy efficiency and sustainability in the municipalities. Transportation, as you all know, is relevant. A city that does not have a transport, uh, a, 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 the correct or an accurate transport system or with the right infrastructure will face problems uh, ahead of time. And we can have the so no, we we have to be sustainable, not only in relation to infrastructure, but we also have to consider health, productivity, and other areas such as education. So we will be uh, left behind if we. W w wouldn't start working on this. I would like to share with you that Mexico is currently leading over a year ago a national body related to uh, sustainable uh, IPIC, uh, uh, International Agency for uh, Incorporation, for uh, ha is headed in France next to the N International Agency of Energy and that is done because he, this agency has been out knowledge related to energy efficiency and sustainability. We have had some impact pr programs uh, at a residential, industrial uh, level, and some of the most important things related to international agendas is transportation. It was included. Uh, and if an energy efficiency plan was created, and one of the items is transportation. So I would like you to look at the documents that you can find in AIPC uh, website, so you can know what we are doing as a country and what we're doing regarding international cooperation with the most important economies in the world. We have raised the importance of this action plan in the G20 framework. We established fin funding principles for uh, energy ef efficiency in the last meeting of ministries, ministers of energy and in the last communication uh, among the ministers. Uh, energy efficiency will be one of the most important and relevant areas. And without further ado, I would like to Thank you for your attention. On behalf of the Ministry of Energy, we know we are all aware that there is a lot to be discussed regarding transportation. I would like to thank Louis and all the, my colleagues from the podium to be able to be here with you this morning. And I wish you a lot of success during this event. Thank you very much. very good speech, uh, very important. The automotive industry uh, has to be at the forefront of, of uh, sustainability and, and uh, you know, becoming more green. And uh, I think what the Mexican government is doing, the Ministry, Ministry of Energy is trying to do, is to support, support this, uh, this move in the correct direction. So I hope, uh, obviously through EMEA, but I hope you're all working uh, or can work uh, with the Ministry of Energy to make sure uh, that we develop the industry in the correct way. Also, some good news for Eduardo from AMIA. I've, seen that I've already seen many retweets uh, from uh, the first uh, AMIA, uh, so that's good. Yes. So I think you, you, you still haven't reached Ronaldo the footballer or Justin Bieber, but, but we are going in the, in the right direction. Uh, and now to give us an overview of how uh, the automotive industry is developing within Mexico, but also putting in a global con uh, uh, context, I'd like to welcome to the, to the podium Brandon Mason, the leader of Autofax Americas from PwC. Thank you. Thank you, Louis, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I regret to inform you that the, the four years of Spanish that I took in high school is not going to be enough 
to allow me to uh, speak it fluently during the presentation. So luckily we have translators for that. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit of what Eduardo already covered. And the good news is that uh, AMA and, and PwC are very closely aligned in terms of our, our sales and assembly outlook on Mexico. But we have a, a little bit of a unique spin on as well. But really to get things going, as I always like to do with these types of presentations, is just to take a quick trip around the world, tell you some of the things that we see going on in other markets. Um, and I want to cover two issues that so far this year have seemed to be quite disruptive, not only within the auto industry, but, but across the globe in terms of the economic impact. The first being oil prices, which um, you know, seems to be top of mind for everybody. So let me just give you our latest and greatest outlook on where we see oil prices going and the impact that they're going to have on the auto industry. So the chart that you see on the left, these are historical Brent oil prices. And you know, right now they're around $30 a barrel, give or take. Uh, that's down over 40% year over year. That's down significantly from you know, the high that we've seen during this, this uh, chart's time period, which was $132 a barrel. Um, when prices first started to fall at the end of 2014, initially it was seen as a very positive development for the economy, right? Consumer spending went up um, because, okay, now all of a sudden I can afford a, a more expensive vehicle. Uh, I can get rid of my small car and move to a crossover or a pickup or, a, or an SUV. That was great for the industry in 2015, particularly in, in North America where we have a, a large dynamic of large crossovers and, and pickups and, and SUVs. We cautioned everybody the last year that there's a near-term impact and a long-term impact. So the long-term impact, although um, you know, it helped boost consumer confidence and, and spending, it could come at the cost of energy independence for countries like the US. And the long-term impact on, on energy companies as we think about future investments, that's now started to come to fruition as we saw in the fourth quarter and into this year when the markets just tanked because as these energy companies started reporting their, their Q4 financials um, that are heavily dependent on oil prices, um, they, they tanked. They dropped significantly. And so uh, the stock markets took a big hit. The other issue being China, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, so the question is, what does this mean for the auto industry? Obviously, right now, you know, the mix, the segmentation mix has changed. It hasn't really had a significant impact in terms of the overall sales volume. Um, you know, to some extent it has. I would say a, a fairly small impact, but more of the segmentation mix, again, particularly in countries that don't have significantly high fuel taxes like the U.S., uh, in Europe, it's a little bit different, obviously. So the question is, what does the industry do from here? Because now the challenge is, from a regulatory standpoint, we saw these emission standards all around the world to meet. And it's going to become increasingly difficult. And now you're starting to see the automakers and the suppliers start to push a little bit harder on, on the regulatory bodies to ease some of these long-term standards. Because if you're talking strictly consumer demand-driven um, segmentation mixes, right? pickups and, and SUVs, are going to remain fairly popular. You know, our friends at Oxford Economics are, are estimating that the 12-month target for, for oil is around $50 a barrel and the 24-month target is around $55 a barrel. Uh, even that, I think, might be a little optimistic. But let's just assume for a second that that's the case, right? What does that do for gasoline? It doesn't rise it, uh, raise it significantly, so you're still talking probably less than $2 a gallon uh, for gas in the U.S. So the industry has a real problem on their hands, right? And this one, we actually don't know how it's going to shake out. Um, the standards are in place and give the automakers credit, you know, despite the fact that demand for electric and hybrid vehicles and other alternative propulsion systems is, is really at, a, at an all-time low um, from, from an industry standpoint in terms of the, the volume that's available out there. They're forging ahead with some of these next-gen technologies, um, despite the fact that, for, for a large part, mainstream consumers don't want them. Um, so we'll, we're obviously going to monitor that closely, but I would expect to see continued and increased pushback from the industry on, on, on the regulators to ease some of those standards because, you know, it's, it's difficult to give up those high volume and high margin pickups and SUVs, but there has to be a balance there at some point. The question is, you know, will the regulators give in um, or will they stand pat? And then the, the industry has some tough decisions to make. Okay, the next issue is, is China, and the title here is, you know, what's all the fuss about, right? I mean, the, the Chinese market over the last five years has averaged, you know, around 8% GDP growth, and then, you know, during 2015, it took some hits, and everybody panicked, and everybody freaked out, and the markets just went into free fall, because the market was only growing at 7%. 
God, what we wouldn't give to have a 7% GDP growth, you know, in, in basically any other market. But it's, it's, you know, aligning expectations, right? So now that we have sort of this new normal expectation, um, the hope is that over, over the next few months that, uh, that, you know, consumer perception in the markets will start, start to ease. Uh, the Chinese market came in in 2015 at 6.9% growth. Uh, there was concerns, too, around, around sales of the industry. But keep in mind that China, unlike many other markets, has a lot of tools at its disposal that it can use to help stimulate growth. Um, there was a 50% reduction in the value-added tax for smaller displacement engines. There's the removal of the one-child policy. There was a devaluation of the currency. There was an easing of lending rates. You know, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, the government has said they will do whatever it takes to keep uh, the economy growing, and particularly the auto industry, which is a pillar industry there. So their new five-year plan calls for an average GDP growth rate of 6.5%, which again, what's all the fuss about? I mean, that's a, that's a really strong growth rate. So as long as we, you know, the industry and, and, every, and, and all the economic markets realize that, okay, 6.5% is still good, and the government's going to do what it takes to keep that going, everything's going to be okay. So talking to folks in this room, I'm talking to the markets, just, just calm down, guys. It's going to be all right. Uh, we still see China as a 30 million unit plus market. Um, by the end of the decade. And there's our, our forecast right there. They came in last year, just over 22 million units of, of automotive assembly, and again, ex uh, eclipsing 30 million units by, by the end of the decade. So we still see very good things for China. All right, I had to get those two things out of the way because I thought they were important because everybody always talks about them. So let's move on to global. Uh, so just a quick look at our global top line. Um, there have been many uh, in, in the automotive and financial communities that, that feel that the end is near for the auto industry, right? That we are basically at a saturation point and that some of these alternative mobility models like car sharing and ride sharing um, and the impact that autonomous vehicles are gonna have on the industry is, is gonna fundamentally change the industry in the very, very near future. Uh, I always kind of laugh at that because while we agree that these trends are continuing to emerge and investment continues to grow, um, they never commit to a specific time period. Right? They always say that, oh, you know, the industry is going to shrink by 60%. Well, when? Uh, well, you know, uh, as an analyst, I always think that's kind of funny, right? And so I'll actually tell you that uh, in our forecast, we still see the, the industry growing. So uh, last year, global automotive assembly came in at around 88 million units. In 2020, we see that growing by 20 million units to 108 million. And although I've got a question mark there in 2025, I can assure you, uh, or reasonably assure you, again, as an analyst, we shouldn't always be absolute. That's our, that's our, our wiggle room there, Louis. Uh, by 2025, we think the industry will continue to grow. A lot of that is driven by emerging market growth. Um, if you look at the growth we even see right now, even with markets like Brazil and Russia uh, down, and then in the future, if you look at markets that have huge growth potential, like India or even here in Mexico, uh, just to put it in perspective, and we'll talk about the Mexican sales outlook in just a moment, but you know, the U.S. is two and a half times larger than Mexico in terms of their population, but has 12 and a half times the amount of automotive sales. So even though we're talking about slightly different economic footprints, there's still huge growth potential. And so we think that those emerging markets are really going to drive forward uh, automotive growth in the, in the near to midterm. And, and those are markets that will likely be slower to adopt some of these emerging technologies that we're talking about. Uh, in fact, we think that growth is going to accelerate here over the next five years. You can see in, from 2010 to 2015, we had a compound annual growth rate of just under 4%. We actually think it's going to be slightly above 4% for the next five years. So still good things to come uh, from a global perspective. I won't spend too much time on this. I know it's a little hard to read for folks in the back, but this is our regional outlook. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of that growth is coming from emerging markets. In fact, 94% of global assembly growth in the next five, five to seven years will be from what we consider to be emerging markets. Most of that is developing Asia Pacific. That's almost two thirds of that growth. Again, that's, that's China. I mentioned India, but that's also some of the ASEAN markets as well. What you might not realize is that the second highest region for growth is actually here in North America, driven largely by both U.S. and Mexico uh, assembly growth. Canada, we actually have, I think, contracting a little bit. But um, the U.S. And, and Mexico are really driving a lot of automotive growth um, looking ahead. So quickly, on a country perspective, so the way that we split this up, we've got top 10 on the left, bottom 10 on the right, sort of the rest of the industry uh, in the middle. What you see there is that, that the top 10 markets are contributing the lion's share of, of that growth, over 20 million units of growth coming from just those 10 markets. In keeping with the, the trend of emerging versus mature markets, eight of those 10 markets 
top 10 markets are emerging markets. And you can see Mexico there is listed as the number three growth market behind uh, China, and I believe that's India at number two. From an OEM perspective, um, the message I want to send here is that um, there's still some uncertainties about near-term and long-term impact, especially with some of the recalls and, and crises that have come up with some of the, the top automakers on the list there. So obviously some have taken a near-term hit. The question is, what's that gonna look like you know, five, six years down the road? Uh, a lot of that has to, deal with, to do with how those OEMs deal with these crises and how quickly they're able to get consumer confidence back. Um, so our hierarchy on that note doesn't really change in terms of the top 10. What is interesting though is if you look at the pie chart, I guess it's a donut chart on the right, um, is that by, by the end of our forecast, we actually have what I would call a more fragmented market despite the need and calls for industry consolidation. So the gray shaded areas there are the, what we just call the other, the other 50 or so alliance groups in the global automotive uh, sector. Uh, a lot of that growth in those other is coming from domestic Chinese OEMs. They're gaining market share in China at, uh, at an alarming rate. Um, and that's coming at the expense of the bigger companies like Volkswagen, like General Motors. Hyundai Kia lost about 2% market share alone last year. And a lot of that's been eaten up by the domestic uh, OEMs. Again, much like the U.S. market in here in Mexico, there's in growing demand for, for CUVs and pickups and SUVs and the domestics um, are a very good point in the industry where they can offer those products at a very competitive price. So we see uh, the domestic OEMs in China continuing to gain share as the industry becomes more fragmented. And obviously there's the possibility for them to expand. Some of them have already expanded into Latin America. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into Mexico. Okay, so that's a look at global. Now let's jump into Mexico. And some of these, again, um, copy what Eduardo had to say. But uh, Eduardo, the good news is we don't have to disagree on much. I think we're very similarly aligned uh, in our outlook. So the chart on the left uh, shows sales, and you can see that from 2010 to 2015, and again, this was recovery volume, right, that we saw in a lot of, of markets, particularly in North America, Mexican automotive sales grew by 71%. And, and actually last year it was an all-time sales record um, for, for vehicle sales in Mexico. Over the next five years, we see a, a much slower rate. And again, this is sort of in lockstep with, with the U.S. market which also had record sales in 2015. We see a year or two of incremental increase before we anticipate there to be an economic downturn around 2018, which will dip sales and then, and then crawl back up, similar to where we're at today. However, on the assembly side, a much different story. Um, although assembly did grow considerably from 2010 to 2015, again, largely due to recovery volume in North America, but we see it growing, and I think Eduardo had mentioned 60% growth is what his organization is forecasting. We're right there at 56% a very strong growth um, in the next five years. So let's get into a little bit about where that is coming from. I can appreciate that uh, the smaller font's a little difficult to read, but we've got the 15 existing plants in Mexico on the left side, uh, and then the five new plants that have been announced on the right. So last year, assembly was around 3.4 million units. We expect assembly in 2020 to be around 5.3, so 1.8, 1.9 million units of growth. So actually, about half of that volume is coming from those existing facilities. Now, that's better utilization. There's also some capacity expansion uh, expected in there. And then the other half is coming from those five new plants uh, that we already mentioned. Now, those are just the plants that have been announced. You know, we could see additional capacity investments. We could see other OEMs come in and, and establish new facilities. But it really is right now a pretty even mix between the existing facilities and new plants that are driving that growth um, of, you know, 1.8, 1.9 million units. Another thing to keep in mind, though, is, is imports. And I often think this is uh, forgotten about in Mexico, and specifically non-NAFTA imports. So last year, the, the overall market grew by about 19%, but non-NAFTA imports actually grew by 33%. That's a pretty significant number. Um, and you can see on the chart on the left there, those were the main importers uh, of non-NAFTA vehicles. Um, you know, some of, that no some of that number will, as we continue to localize assembly in Mexico, will go down, but also you're starting to see a pretty strong uptick in luxury vehicle sales as well. So some of those luxury OEMs um, that aren't necessarily establishing a manufacturing base here or just have such a broad product mix they can only put so many products here, uh, you'll continue to see imports tick upwards um, in the coming years. So again, if we think about considerations here from a logistics perspective, that's another consideration that, that um, our logistics providers and the OEs and suppliers have to think about as well. So at PwC, we're having these conversations um, on the OE side and supplier side. We're helping them 
determine, you know, from a balancing act of, of cost versus efficiency, what are your best options? And, you know, the industry's been talking about this for the last few years, and I look forward to the comments today as we continue to address this issue, right? With all this expansion that's going on in Mexico and, and uh, tightness and, and capacity constraints on the infrastructure, how do we deal with it? And we've also worked with the, the logistics side of the business. You know, how do you increase your capacities at your existing facilities, whether that's ports, whether that's rail, whether that's the carriers, and how do you make yourselves more attractive to those OEs and suppliers that are looking for alternative solutions? The last thing I'll mention here is, is around the economic outlook. Um, the chart on the left is, is GDP growth by market for North America. And you see that, again, this is from Oxford Economics. They feel that you know, the, the GDP growth outlook for Mexico is going to outpace the U.S. and Canada. So uh, you know, a lot of that is, is due to increased manufacturing. Um, I think Eduardo mentioned 3.2% is the auto GDP. Uh, I would expect that number to continue to trend upwards as that investment comes along. He also brought up a good point about uh, the need for more talent, especially in, in the, um, on the automotive side of the business. As all these plants add up, you need skilled labor. And so additional training and things like that, I think, will also be required. The chart on the right just shows GDP per capita in, in Mexico. Um, you know, despite a little rough year in 2015, we expect that to improve throughout this year. And then you know, the GDP per capita outlook also looks positive as well. So we think in the near to midterm, there's a lot of positive signs for, for the Mexican uh, economy. And, and obviously, that will bode well for, for sales and, and, and assembly. So I'll leave it at that. I, I thank you so much for your attention. And I look forward to the comments and questions during the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we had some very interesting uh, presentations that started, off to, started us off today. Uh, a focus on Mexico City, uh, our wonderful hosts. Uh, and then we looked at uh, the development of the automotive industry with Amir. We looked at the energy strategy for Mexican government. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Santiago had to leave for a, a very important uh, appointment that came up suddenly. So he's not available for the, for the questions. And of course, Brandon Mason with his uh, overview of the, and forecast for production and sales in, in Mexico and around the world. So uh, we haven't got much time for questions. Uh, and because the, the next session is quite an important one with the governor, uh, with the secretary of the economy. But we always want to give you the opportunity uh, to ask uh, to ask a question or to make a comment. Uh, the, the usual rules are, if you raise your hand, uh, wait for the microphone to come to you so we can hear you clearly, uh, to say your name and your company name, and then ask the question. And of course, the, the question can be in, in Spanish or English. So uh, I'll give you the opportunity first, if anyone has a, has a question they, they want to ask to, to start us off. Uh, this is not a question, this is a comment for the presentation of uh, Dr. Eduardo Solis. Uh, my name is Rafael Lopez from Ford Motor Company, Director of Logistics. I think, uh, Dr. Solis, you and uh, you, your statement about the challenge that we have in, uh, in logistic infrastructure, we fully agree with that statement. Also, we agree that the challenge is uh, there's no, there's no problem. There is a huge opportunity to improve the facilities and be sure that we, that we have everything set to continue the growing of this industry that we, all of us, are proud of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. I certainly would expect that as a full member of uh, our association, we wouldn't disagree. <laughs> no, no, I think uh, that uh, it is a tremendous challenge, uh, but uh, I like the way you put it because uh, at the same time it is uh, a tremendous opportunity too. Okay, uh, and a kind of a follow-up to that really. Um, what are the biggest issues in your AMIA meetings when you get the senior director of the car makers together would you be able to say what are the top three issues? You don't have to go into details about them, but what are the top three things that they, they're eager to discuss and need your support to lobby government or, or whatever it is? And where, is, uh, where in that level is, 
is logistics and supply chain. Would that be in the top three, in the top five, in the top ten? Um, I would say that um, if uh, you say 2016, mm -hmm. it is in the top uh, five. Mm -hmm. If this is uh, going forward towards uh, 2020, it is uh, the top three. And yes, of course, that is uh, the whole uh, uh, issue about uh, having together all of the companies uh, to tackle our uh, industry-wide issues. So what is one and two? Um, well, I cannot uh, take apart uh, labor. Mm -hmm. um, I said that uh, we have three issues going forward towards uh, 2020, mm -hmm. and the three uh, main issues is uh, uh, world-class uh, labor force and the, the, the flow of these uh, uh, world-class labor force. Mm -hmm. um, of course, logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, number three is uh, supply chain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and to Victor, Mexico City, uh, what are you doing to support the automotive industry? What is your region doing to support automotive? First of all, in this current administration, a new investment office was opened for soft landing of investment in Mexico. We have our ombudsman for investment in Mexico City that ensures that local authorities may not be an obstacle for investment in Mexico City. Mexico City is the city with higher competitiveness among the country, and we do have fiscal incentives. Obviously, Mexico City does not have room for the large automotive companies anymore, but we do have room for development centers, for corporate offices, and we help, we assist investors with soft landing, with fiscal incentives for joint training of staff, and we build links with technological centers, research centers, and universities to develop human capital. So uh, another question for you. Uh, we heard from uh, the Ministry of Energy about what they are doing for the environment. Like every big city, not just Mexico City, every big city has uh, environmental issues. What are, what are you doing? Perhaps specifically, uh, do you have anything for the automotive or logistics and transportation industries, any plans on how you can, they can, what role they can play to reduce the pollution of Mexico City? A program has been developed throughout Mexico City, devoted on mobility. We have a new mobility secretary with many, many plans. But let me explain what is happening in terms of contamination in Mexico City and mobility problems throughout the city. In the metropolitan area of Mexico City, we have about 21 million people. Out of those 21 million people, 9 million live in the federal district, which is now the new Mexico City. This means that Six million people enter and exit the city every single day. We're saying that you're f trying to make the entire Barcelona population in another city every single day and take them out the same day. So such a complexity in terms of mobility is huge. We're talking about six million people who come here every single day to work, to go to school, to shop, to do business. Mexico City has a public and private transportation system in, in the entire apparatus. There's a tremendous goal, for the f for a c tremendous challenge. For Mexico City, we are working on a public-private association in order to create uh, an innovation center that will search f for 
innovation both for electric energy, uh, for electricity, water, as well as transportation, because we know those are the main issues or mega cities among the world. We need to work on sustainability. That is why Mexico City is trying to work on an LA incubator model. Clean tech has also invested in the model. There are they are have become partners of Mexico City. So we will try to find new development, new innovation and mobility mechanisms for Mexico City. Of course we need to talk about home office but infrastructure works in order to work on taxing throughout the city. In terms of public transportation, there we want public private investment in order to attain sustainability among Mexico City and there are infrastructure works to improve flow throughout Mexico City. We know that according to our forecast we will not only talk about six million people in the f next five years, that number will rise to seven million people. Uh, perhaps a chance for one final question. Uh, in the middle there, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Fernando Rodriguez from Bocar Group. And this question is for Dr. Eduardo Solis. Uh, what are AMIA and the companies, members of AMIA, doing for contrasting the imports of used cars that may affect the growth of the automotive industry as it's expected for the future years. Thank you very much, um, Fernando. Um, my answer could take like 45 minutes. <laughs> so it's difficult for me to give you the one minute version of the answer. Um, we have been working pretty hard uh, with uh, with the federal government, I will say uh, shoulder to shoulder and hand in hand to act against uh, the imports of uh, used vehicles uh, that are imported from the United States. Um, we have been so successful in um, this regard that uh, 2015 for the first time the imports of used cars were reduced more than 60%. Our final numbers for 2015 are not ready, but uh, numbers of uh, November 2015 uh, are giving us the lead that uh, the reduction is going to be more than 60, 60%. Uh, this uh, success has been um, achieved uh, thanks to three main uh, um, uh, items that are in the agenda uh, of the federal government. Uh, one is uh, judicial. Uh, in the judicial system, the uh, Supreme uh, Court uh, acted uh, against uh, those that were trying to get around the used uh, cars decree, uh, declaring that this decree is constitutional. So now no more amparos uh, or injunctions could be used to get around the decree. Uh, number two is uh, op operative uh, actions. Acting, uh, for example, against those that were uh, wrongdoing uh, in the process of imports of used cars, including, of course, uh, custom brokers or agentes uh, aduanales and uh, the importers themselves. Um, and um, uh, these uh, operative actions have been conducted by the uh, Ministry of Finance, the Secretaría de Hacienda, uh, in particular, el Sistema de Administración Tributaria. Um, and um, Including this, 
uh, actions is number three, which is uh, normative. Uh, we have been also successful in putting in place uh, standards uh, for the imports of used cars, including, of course, the standards for emissions. Um, we still have to have one a final decision of the Supreme Court to also have a constitutional uh, right under these, uh, the, 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 the acuerdo, the agreement that uh, sets the standards for emissions for imports of used cars. One more decision, we already have four uh, of the Supreme Court. So we have been quite uh, successful uh, over the last, uh, I would say, two years. Uh, I have to recognize the effort of the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of the Economy um, in uh, uh, setting the pace for uh, the deterrence or imports of these uh, used cars that have uh, no question made a tremendous damage to our domestic market. Uh, the result is that uh, last year we grew 19% in the domestic uh, market in Mexico. Okay, thank you very much for the question and the answer. Unfortunately, we have no more time for, for questions now. Uh, but I think I'd like to thank the panel for a fantastic start to our conference and very interesting information. Thank you. Please join us for coffee uh, just across the corridor there in the exhibition area. Visit the stands of the sponsors and we will start uh, on time at 12 o'clock, uh, at 11 o'clock, sorry, uh, for, the, for the Secretary of yes, the Economy. absolutely. Thank you. I regard it very much. I would, yeah, you bring it forward. I don't know.